Jamestown, the first permanent English colony in the New World, was founded in 1607, but then gradually faded from view after Virginia's capital moved to Williamsburg. In 1994, the Jamestown Rediscovery Project began excavations that would unearth the original site of James Fort. Two decades of excavations have revealed numerous buildings, cellars, wells, and burials that tell the story of the early colony. In April of 2012, archaeologists identified a cellar to one of the colony's earliest buildings. They had come across many cellars before, but this one contained a shocking discovery. While excavating through layers of trash deposited by the colonists, the archaeologists found partial skeletal remains of a young English woman. Forensic evidence showed that this individual had been processed to be cannibalized. The story told by these bones is of the colony's darkest hour, the starving time winter of 1609-1610. Primary documents left by the survivors corroborate this discovery with multiple reports of cannibalism that winter. The fledgling colony was spared with the arrival of supplies and new leadership in June of 1610. Jamestown would survive, and the lessons learned during the starving time winter would guide the colonists to making Virginia a success. From the very first months of the colony, the Jamestown settlers had a hard time feeding themselves. Captain John Smith's skill at trading European goods to Virginia Indians for their corn kept the colony going. But a large supply fleet from England in the summer of 1609 was scattered by a massive hurricane. The ships that did limp to the colony that August carried few supplies, but a few hundred more mouths to feed. Among the newly arrived colonists was the young girl whose remains would be found more than 400 years later in the cellar. These new settlers ate through the colony's seven acres of planted corn in three days. A month later, a mysterious gunpowder explosion severely injured Smith, the acting president of the colony at that time and that explosion sent him back to London to recuperate. The James Fort settlers now faced the coming winter with fractured leadership, few food resources, and a break with the Powhatan Indian chieftain that surrounded them. The leader of that chieftain had set warriors around the fort to shoot any English colonists who ventured out for food. The winter of 1609-1610 would be the worst starving time the colony had ever known a test of the Fort Settlers' humanity and will to live. I'm standing here uh, in the archaeological excavation of a cellar room uh, that is uh, located within the, the site of 1607 James Fort. Here we recently discovered the mutilated skull and severed leg bone of an English teenage girl that was found lying among uh, the, the discarded butchered horses, animal, uh, other, other animal bones, dogs, that indicates that this material was deposited from uh, the starving time of 1609 to 1610. This discovery may confirm a number of 17th century references uh, which describe uh, the starving time and, and the desperation of the colonists uh, and that, that some of them uh, resorted to uh, li living off of the people that died first. Uh, in fact, there's even a reference that a man uh, killed and ate his wife. Uh, this uh, was discovered, this crime, and the man was executed. Right now we've taken out the uh, native pot that was right here, so we're going to try and pedestal this around so that we can remove this as one big block of dirt and then excavate it in the lab. Yeah, you might want to put one on the back side right here. You ready? Should just go. And we got it to the lab. 
Once the pedestal uh, reached the lab, we needed to excavate it in a careful manner uh, in order to uh, eke out as much information we could from the skeletal remains. It was immediately noticed upon their cleaning that there were uh, abnormal marks that needed the attention of a forensic anthropologist at the Smithsonian. Jamestown Rediscovery archaeologists have worked with the Smithsonian's forensic anthropologists for 20 years. The biological profile of every skeleton is unique, so a bone biography, combined with evidence at the scene of excavation, can answer many questions about the life of an unidentified person. Forensic information in bones can tell us age, gender, ancestry, diet, height, whether there was injury or illness, and even cause of death. In years past, Doug Owsley and his Smithsonian team have examined a Jamestown skeleton that had been shot in the leg, and another that proved to be a young boy hit with an arrow in 1607. The Smithsonian provided important clues that another James Fort burial was that of Captain Bartholomew Gosnell, a major planner of the colony. The expertise of Owsley's team has even aided in facial reconstruction of early settlers, based on the story written in their bones. Owsley and his team have a long history of assisting law enforcement agencies in the analysis of human remains in modern criminal cases. Now, the Jamestown Rediscovery archaeologists were asking the Smithsonian team to use the latest technology to answer this question. Was this set of bones a case of 17th century cannibalism? The level of analysis is to try and match up any other components in the bones that have been recovered, the animal bones, and within this the, the Jamestown team brought to our attention a tibia, and this is a partial fragment of a right tibia. The tibia is a shin bone. This is the portion beneath the knee. And at the time of recovery, you had a partial in two fragments, proximal epiphysis of this tibia. And it was in the process of uniting. There's no doubt in my mind, this, the size of this, this is clearly female. And the age is absolutely consistent with this young individual here. So these are portions of the same body, part of the same skeleton. And so we'll examine both of them at some point, and probably initially, the head had been removed from the neck. So the person had been decapitated. We have separation here at the occipital condyles. And that undoubtedly involved cutting, but we don't have a physical evidence of that. What we're seeing is essentially a forceful tearing and separation of the head from the body. We have an aborted attempt to break the cranium open with four impacts that were cutting through the tissue and, and scoring the bone, but not that deeply. Then a shift to the back of the cranium with more serious impacts to the back of the cranium here that actually broke into the cranium, radiating fractures, radiating fractures. So the person is attempting to gain entry into the vault, presumably to remove the brain, and in order to do that, they then concentrate on this left side of the head. We do have a portion of the left lower side of the head, the left temporal, and on this, what we've got is a radiating fracture across the occipital squamous. So this is going to be this area. What you're seeing right here is the ear hole. This is the mastoid process behind the ear. Now. When you look at this, there's a very unusual feature. There's a partially defined rectangular penetrating defect. And when you study the borders of this, you'll see that the posterior and superior margin of this rectangular defect, this partially defined rectangular defect, has got external beveling, indicating that something's in and perhaps working to pry this bone away. It's all here, it all, it all fits together in terms of uh, a sequence of events. When you look at this portion of the maxilla, the right maxilla, it's represented in this fragment here, and you look at it closely, but you also then we examine it through stereo zoom microscopy to photo document it, and you'll see that there are multiple cuts in this area right here. So there's a clear intent 
and completion of a process that led to removing the brain, but there's also evidence that there was cutting with a different tool. So this would be our third tool. We have some type of some type of cleaver or hacking implement. We have some sort of pry bar that is used over here that has a rectangular rectangular edge, and now we've got a very fine knife, and that fine knife is leaving marks at specific locations. And if you're cutting in this area, then you're essentially dealing with the muscles. This would be the masseter attempting to move, uh, attempting to remove facial musculature here. Had much of the postcranial skeleton found to examine, but this one piece, it also, this right tibia, proximal right tibia fragment, also has a clear cleaver chop that cut from posterior to end here with a slight downward angle. And it progressed about, in terms of looking at the cut, it progressed oh, halfway through the bone. Then you can see that the angle of the blade shifted just slightly, leaving a little stair step and a very smooth, this is all cut surface. So you've got essentially a, a very forceful chop that cut almost two thirds of the way through the bone and then breakage of the limb to uh, facilitate and finalize the process of removing the lower leg. And if you look at it with close up eyes and under series of microscopy, you'll see that there are at least, at least four uh, very fine knife cuts that were also, uh, this type of tool was also used then in separating the lower leg. So you've got essentially cutting a serious chop or a serious chop and then cutting to remove the lower leg. The archaeologists and forensic anthropologists wanted to know what Jane may have looked like. To accomplish this, a number of experts involved in facial reconstruction were called upon. The bones from Jane's skull had been splintered into many fragments, and it was up to the experts to piece those fragments back together. With them in place, Jane's skull could take shape, and a model could be produced by professional sculptors and forensic anthropologists to recreate her facial features and bring us all face to face with Jane. I couldn't help but think or wonder what I would do to stay alive if I were caught up in that dreadful starving time. So after all, in that sense, we really do know who Jane is. She is us. <laughs>